Hello, I'm Waqar Rizvi, and this is Scope. Now, a number of days ago, just two days ago, in fact, the U.S. envoy to Special Representative for Iran, um, Brian Hook, wrote an article in the Wall Street Journal saying that the U.S. is ready to snap back or use the snapback mechanism within the JCPOA to have sanctions, U.N. sanctions, brought back onto Iran. All of this is because the United States is concerned about the arms embargo that is set to expire very soon. It wants that to be extended. Um, the Europeans have spoken about possibly having a new arms embargo of sorts negotiated with Iran and brought to the fore against the country at this time. But the U.S. has gone as far as saying it would want that snapback mechanism if the arms embargo is vetoed by the likes of the Russians and the Chinese. Uh, even within the U.S., though, now there are voices that are saying that that talk of snapback, at the very least, is not a good idea. Uh, because Iran has already threatened that it may very well walk away from the NPT. Now, we don't know if that is an empty promise or a legitimate promise on the part of Iran, because that sort of thing has been promised in the past as well uh, at various times by the Iranians. However, just the threat of it is important enough. And secondly, what would it really gain? Would it really ensure that people around the world respect A, the UN sanctions, and B, the arms embargo on Iran? It's not like Iran has the capability to be able to buy really expensive weapons anyways. So what really is the U.S. gaining from all of this at this time, apart from just possibly wanting the nuclear deal to fall apart altogether, which may very well be the goal going into these elections in November, especially if Trump thinks that Biden may win. Uh, he essentially will, will give Biden a situation where Biden won't be able to even walk back into the nuclear deal if he so wins again in November this year. Let's discuss all of that a bit further. We're joined now by Reza Khan Zadeh, who is a research fellow at the Sharif University think tank and is a PhD candidate at the University of Oxford. He's joining us this morning from Washington, D.C. Joining us from London is Farhang Jahanpur, who is a part-time tutor at the Department of Continuing Education at Kellogg College at the University of Oxford. Farhang and Reza, thank you both for your time today. Uh, Farhang, let me start with you. Um, what do you make of Brian Hook's um, article, essentially, and, and the U.S. demand that the arms embargo be extended on Iran? Well, it's very, very strange, strange, but we have got used to some very strange happenings in Washington. Um, as you know, May last year, um, the United States uh, violated the deal which the previous U.S. administration had reached, not only with Iran, but with all the international community, as well as the Security Council 2231, which uh, supported it, uh, unilaterally withdrew. But that was not all. It even uh, in, uh, introduced some very severe sanctions on Iran, which President Trump some time ago said has been the most severe imposed on any country ever. And not only did the U.S. impose those sanctions, it has even forced other countries not to trade with Iran because of U.S. dollar being the international currency. But now, after all that, they have not achieved anything which they wanted because they said, as a result of the maximum pressure, they will bring Iran to its knees. It hasn't brought to its knees. And so now they are trying to go back to this com completely nonsensical idea of America's snapback because not only it violated the JCPOA, the nuclear deal, it also imposed sanctions contrary uh, to the Security Council resolution. So there are neither members of the Security Council resolution 2231 nor of the JCPOA. The Russian envoy at the UN called it delusional, and even just yesterday the Chinese envoy called it stupid. Uh, and even the European allies. Are, are very um, uh, suspicious about these moves. Uh, so yes, these are some very strange things which we have got used to and probably will continue to the end of the current administration. Reza, I wonder why it is that the arms embargo is so important for the Iranians. Because as I said in my intro, it's not like the Iranians right now, at the very least, have the capability to buy really expensive weapons, right? So, I mean, you know, the economy, as we can all agree, is not doing very well in the current situation. So why is this important for Iran to have this arms embargo lifted? Right. Um, I feel that the importance here has more to do with a symbolic and foreign policy and also a domestic policy type of um, presentation, if you will. Because uh, as you noted earlier in the program, uh, the types of arms, the type of you know weapons that, that Iran would like to get its hands on 
are are too expensive. And even though rest, even though um, you know, um, the countries like Russia have have been have been vocal on wanting this to be lifted so they can sell arms to Iran. Um, currently, uh, or, you know, most, most, just most recently, you know, Russia has been showing signs of kind of, you know, dragging its feet, if you will, when it comes to selling Iran certain types of weapons or even, um, you know, denying Iran certain types of weapons. Um, so for Iran, it is, it is more of, I believe, a symbolic gesture that, um, that you know, A, that the U.S. can't do whatever it wants. Um, I do agree with Dr. Jahanpur um, that, that the U.S. walking away from the JCPOA and then wanting to come back and have these snapback you know, mechanisms into place. Um, it, it is very, you know, silly or stupid as, as it's been, you know, noted. Um, but it's also for, for, you know, Tehran to show that, um, we've been right all along when it comes to negotiating with, you know, with Washington or particularly with Trump, um, that it just, you can't do it. You can't trust them. This is the way they do business. This is the way they deal with other types of, you know, deals and treaties and countries. And we were right, they were wrong. And, you know, going to the point also about Biden, um, him having more struggles as far as trying to bring, bring the U.S. back into this deal. I think, I think the question more should be asked, will you know, will Tehran, or you know, more, just more specifically, will the supreme leader of Iran want to have mm -hmm. such a scenario play out, where there is a possibility of the U.S. coming back to the JCPOA? I, I doubt. I, you know, to see Iran wanting that to happen um, mm -hmm. would actually show okay. a sign of weakness on their part. All right, so Farhang, uh, if we talk about the worst case scenario, right? Because when it comes to the snapback mechanism, right? With the arms embargo, we know that the Russians and the Chinese can veto that. But um, it seems when it comes to the snapback mechanism as understood within uh, the Security Council Resolution 2231, seemingly uh, the argument is being made on the part of US officials and is being understood by many legal experts who have read that in great detail that the US is still in some odd way possibly an original party to that resolution and so can still hold some sway in the regard of snapback mechanism. And, and the snapback mechanism is also odd because uh, it cannot be vetoed. In, it, I mean, it, it, doesn't, it defies logic in some ways why that was even agreed upon by the Iranians. But uh, considering it was, uh, do you think that that may very well happen? Like, do you think there's a very realistic possibility of that happening? And then how would the Iranians react? Because the Iranians have said, if that happens, we'll walk away from the NPT, for example. Well, you said that Iranians have threatened many times in the past to do certain things, but they have not carried them out. I think we should not really count on that, because on a number of issues, they have actually done exactly what they said. For example, after the U.S. attack uh, and assassination of General Soleimani, they did attack U.S. bases. Earlier on, they did attack, uh, bring down a U.S. drone on Iranian territory, uh, and so on. And so I think if it goes that far, it will make the situation much, much more dangerous for everybody. I advise very strongly that Iranians should really abide within the JCPOA and convince the European powers to also abide by it, as they are saying that they would like to do. Uh, but as I said, it really has nothing to do with law. You mentioned a few lawyers uh, who have said that America somehow magically has the power to do this. These are very partisan lawyers, international lawyers, believe that America has no legs whatsoever, either legal or moral legs to stand on, because it violated the deal. It cannot go back. If they want to go back to the resolution 2231, they say they are members of it, they should lift the sanctions first and then talk about the other issues. I think a very important issue that we must bear in mind is that, as uh, Mr. Khanzadeh said, of course, it has partly to play 
with the, Iran's domestic issues, because they also have a uh, politics, domestic politics. But it also has a lot to do with American domestic politics. Mm. I think on the combination of a large number of disappointments by uh, President Trump, and now, of course, being caught with the virus, he really wants to have a way out. So to my mind, there are two major issues behind all this nonsense and all this talk. One is the domestic issue before going to the next election in November. And the second thing is to divert attention from Israel's annexation of more Palestinian territory and, in fact, its nuclear program. The only country <coughs> in the Middle East which has nuclear weapons is not Iran, it is Israel. Yeah. So to try to divert attention from that and also from the annexation of more Palestinian lands, I think is, is what is behind this. All right, Reza, I'll give you the final word. I'll let you both go. Um, what do you think the coming days hold? Because uh, there is a lot of, you know, pessimistic, fatalistic talk about how Donald Trump and his team just want this deal to collapse before November's elections. And then that would work very well with their, their voter base. Uh, is that actually likely to happen? Well, the likelihood of that happening, I believe, um, is somewhat uh, somewhat high. Uh, but that's to take into into you know consideration a vast number of variables, um, both you know both foreign and domestic, um, and just and just more specifically, the Trump administration's very poorly job handling of the COVID you know virus. You know, within its borders, um, but then also it's 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 face value as far as its foreign um, affairs as well. You know, Trump canceling the funding to the HWO, for example, um, and you know things of that nature kind of point into a direction of where um, him wanting to completely dismantle or destroy or, you know, things of that nature of the JCPOA. Um, yeah. I feel it just, it, it, it just leads, leads the U.S. down a path where trying to return into a more, you know, diplomatic mm. stance with the entire, you know, world community would be more difficult for future presidents. Okay, we'll leave it there at that, but we appreciate Reza and Farhang for their time and, of course, their expertise. Um, when it comes to this, uh, the arms embargo A and then the snapback mechanism B as options for the U.S. to continue its pressure campaign on Iran, uh, it's interesting to note how this may all play out because it seems, it seems we're coming now into the final laps of what exactly will happen to the JCPOA, the Iran nuclear deal? Um, are these the, the final breaths of that deal altogether? Will the U.S. be able to force the hand of all the other signatories, in a sense, to just making this deal collapse altogether, especially if the worst-case scenario of the snapback mechanism uh, comes into play? Will the Russians, the Chinese, or the others, even the Europeans, be able to save the deal in some way? Iran has been asking all of the above, especially the Europeans, to do more uh, to ensure that the country continues to, or has at least, any of the benefits that it was promised under this deal. Um, that has not yet worked out very well for the Iranians. And as I said, when, it, when you read the details of the snapback mechanism, I could be wrong, of course, but it seems that um, within that, um, the snapback mechanism cannot be vetoed um, if that is brought to the fore, although there are some complex legal issues and clauses within that which are, are to be discussed and should be discussed openly and are at this point in time being discussed by many legal experts, uh, especially online. I'll leave it there for that. I'll be back with the next segment after.